very boring and bottom up with respect to the uh, chip seal program. So I uh, just ask for a motion to approve that amendment agenda. Councilor Valerio, Councilor Tangenko, Mayor Saberman, and Councilor Perry. We have one set of minutes uh, from the July 19th uh, meeting, and then we'll just ask for a motion to adopt the program as well. Councilor Valerio, Councilor Lovelet, all in favor. Very proud of the news of 10 months. Councilor <laughs> White, I think, is. I'm not really seeing any friends right now. Uh, okay, so uh, we have one delegation this evening, uh, Matt Thompson, and on behalf of the Sunshine Coast Affordable Housing Society. Matt, uh, welcome. Can I hand that Staff who are not here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I just wanted to come and give a quick quick update with regards to the affordable housing project. Um, the handout in front of me just has to speak to me because I didn't think I'd give a PowerPoint for tonight. But um, uh, as you know, I last saw you on June 21st, so towards the end of June, uh, it's a request a letter of support for our CMHC application. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the way that the letter was phrased um, doesn't meet the requirements of CMHC. So for an application to get seed funding, you need to, you need to have um, of the possibility of building five units or more. And so the phrasing of one of five road dedication locations identified to, to the Sunshine Coast Affordable Housing Society as a pilot for the purposes of constructing affordable rental and ownership um, doesn't meet those requirements. So it really is just about getting that number of five. Um, and again, the reminder is that the purpose of the seed funding is to do the feasibility, the financial feasibility, uh, to determine what rent levels, um, what the size of the units would be, what's feasible on the properties. Um, so despite this, you know, we've been working with Cliff to try to, to continue the pro move the project forward and with the, the break in August, we're able to come and see council sooner, uh, but we did want to get on, on the agenda for the first fall meeting. Um, so, you know, because of the limitations um, of some of the sites, we've determined that probably the, the Franklin Road and Harmony Lane site is, is the most feasible from a financial perspective. Um, just it's a flat site, it's building, it's in the, it's in the zone that, or the area that allows laneway houses. Um, so there's a possibility of a laneway house if we can meet the planning requirements. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we, we haven't been able to, to CMHC, that being said, Click has started with their technical service evaluation, which is just going to give us the cost estimate for um, servicing and, and requirements on the lot, which will work into our eventual business plan and, and financial feasibility model. Um, so really, you know, this is a request. Uh, you indicated that if things were moving slowly, I'd come back and see you and ask for resources. So that's kind of what I'm here for. Um, is we see, you know, we see an advantage in, in Moving this forward quickly, and even if you know, even if we were to get the letter to CMHC tomorrow, it would probably still be a good two months before before funding was in place. So, what I what I've proposed here is that um, we're asking for a small grant of four thousand dollars for the initial pilot property, the financial feasibility on that. Um, that would allow us to determine whether we can come in at an affordable rent, and and you know whether it would be a rental or ownership. Um, whether it would be leased land or a donation from the town, so work out some of those things on on that one site, um, and then see if that's upscaling, uh, if that's upscalable to the other sites as well or not. Um, so that's, I mean, that's essentially the gist of it. The other ask that we have is to to start the revision of the letter of process so that we can, you know, we can start the CMHC application. Um, maybe that doesn't happen right away. Maybe you want to see some results from the pilot first, or maybe you. you you know, just move the, the process along a little bit faster if we had the letter kind of in hand um, to use, even if we held off on our application for a little bit of this work to be done. So um, that's that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Um, and we'll be hearing from the uh, director of planning shortly, anyway. But in his report, uh, I noted that um, your society was invited by uh, residents uh, to a bit of a briefing, and it looks like there was a fair number of people showed up. Can you speak to uh, 
Yeah, we were we were invited by members or the residents of the Heritage Hills neighborhood to come down and look at the sites, and they expressed expressed um, pretty serious concern over the geotech um, the geotech issues on the two Bowles Lane properties, uh, as well as concerns around those being a wildlife corridor. Um, I think that was the sort of there there were other concerns expressed too, but that was a consensus among the neighborhood was. Um, you know, there's really serious concern. They, they see it as a greenway, as a wildlife corridor, and um, given the given the, the issues of the slope along those properties and the size of the parcels, um, they you know they, they thought that that would be of major concern. Now, I, from what I understand, the geotech uh, process has started through planning. I don't know what the whether there are any results um, from that or not, but that was that was the gist of it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you for your presentation at the uh, affordable housing session up in Seychelles there. It was put on by our uh, MLA. So I appreciate that. Anything else from the council on that one? Okay, that's fine. Then. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Okay, Andre, um, 5.1 dealing with the, uh, the project. Uh, I don't know if there's Anything you want to add to your report? It was pretty comprehensive. It's, yeah. well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's one thing I need to verify, correct? Um, when I was writing this report, I was assuming that for to use the uh, sanitary reserve fund for the affordable housing, that a uh, expenditure bylaw would be required. Um, but the legislation has changed from that a couple of years ago, and I wasn't aware of that. So it doesn't require a bylaw. So it's, it's an easier option than I thought. So if you look at the end of the report, where you have different options between uh, considering funding for the grant request, uh, was, uh, it's a pretty similar options between one and two, either from the operational budget or from the um, affordable housing reserve fund. Okay, so just to be clear then, under uh, option two, there's not a requirement that for an expenditure by law, you can access funds from the affordable housing fund for this purpose without having to go to a special one. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Uh, okay, so uh, your report didn't address the, the amount, but it is indicated in uh, Mr. Thompson's uh, submission here to us this evening that he's looking for approximately $4,000 to be able to conduct the uh, feasibility study. And that would be sufficient, do you think, for, for that? Uh, questions from Council? And yes, I did invite him to come back if he <laughs> ran into a roadblock to see if he could see. Um, so it sounds like it's not a roadblock, it's just a process. Uh, yes, Councilor Sandy. I'll just make a, a comment more than anything. I, now that Andre's explained uh, the difference with option two, um, I, I would be in agreement with moving forward for uh, a $4,000 grant to come out of the reserve funds for affordable housing and uh, keep the project moving along for the society. Okay. So your motion we're basically looking to receive the report and then to direct uh, staff to provide four thousand dollars from the affordable housing program uh, for this or sorry fund rather for the uh, feasibility study that's uh, on the end. Yeah. So is there a second for that? Any further discussion or concerns around that? It's, uh, I think it fits with what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, so seeing nothing else, then I'll just ask for a vote on that one in favor then. Okay, so that's carried. Thank you, Matt. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing the results of that uh, that proposal. Okay, uh, 5.2. Uh, to do with the uh, record board referral for the coastal spill and brewery application. Um, looks like a very exciting project. Uh, really, uh, at this point, uh, we're only seeking the permission of the council, so the direction of the council to initiate the notification process. Is that correct? Nothing else is involved right at this point. Um, comment? No? Can you move that? Yeah, I'll leave that if nobody else has comments. Yeah, support the. Okay, you can go to the next. So, so we 
receive that report and direct the staff to initiate the notification process as moved by Councilor Valeria, second by Councilor Longley. Any further comment? Looks like a very exciting project. Uh, it will fit very well with, I think, what we're trying to accomplish here. So uh, I hope there's a plan to kind of move forward. So all in favor then? Okay, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, 5.3, uh, license to occupy. So this has to do with the uh, arts building next door. Um, so Selena basically uh, looking for council's approval to uh, allow the sublet for Huckle Harry, uh, a post daycare society. They started operation now, I gather, or this week or will be, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and the other part of your report there is uh, we need some direction or at least uh, some views from council as to the uh, the rent going forward for the next uh, two years in the uh, in the license. Right? Okay. And your proposal is that at the moment it's two hundred and fifty dollars a month, and the proposal is that for we increase to three hundred. And they remain responsible for the utilities. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, council changed in 2015 from charging uh, this group a flat rate that was inclusive of utilities and GST in the hopes of uh, realizing some energy efficiencies by making the tenant responsible for all of their share of the utilities, and, the, and that was net. Now, uh, their utilities for their September to June period this year amounted to just under $1,200 uh, for the same period last year. Had we been using the same formula, it would have been over 2000 So <clears throat> I think council's intent was met, and, and uh, council wanted an opportunity to review within one year. And uh, we're at that one year point, and we're looking at, um, you know, we're looking at a past year that shows success in an upcoming year with some changes, as I've noted in my report, we're potentially moving um, a daycare in there to operate four days a week. So council may want to renew for two years as recommended, or you, you may choose to renew for a shorter period and look at reviewing again based on increased um, usage of the facility. Okay, thank you. Council Valeria. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, the recommended increase, the rationale seems Pretty sound. I, I just note that I, I did ask Mr. Um, Mary Baker, and I think they're starting next up week, but there is a fledgling uh, organization. So um, it, it was noted that they don't have capacity to absorb um, in many cost increases, and that they don't be, um, I forget the interest fees, but they don't have access to the same type of funding as some other, some other daycares um, through other levels of government. So it, it seems, seems like a reasonable increase considering the extended use and the energy conservation seems to be working. Um, they did note that they're not, they, it would be helpful to get for them to get better data so that they can, so they know how much energy, energy they're using on a monthly board. So I don't know if they can do it on a daily, but certainly on a, on a monthly. Basis. So um, I, I would support the, the promotions as, as they stand in the, in the nominal uh, increase in the flat rate. Great, thank you. Yeah, even with that, it's still um, very well subsidized by the by the town. But they're both um, enterprises that uh, the council supports and working in our community. So, uh, yeah, so I'm fine to take that as a motion moved by Councilor Barrett, then second. Councilor um, Sandenko, all in favor then? And that's carried. So, we got that, Selena? You, you have that? I have that. Okay. okay. Uh, 5.4 upcoming conferences. Um, really, uh, I think all that's needed here is just a motion um, uh, as, as set out in the recommendation. And anybody that's interested in attending either of those conferences can simply uh, go ahead then and uh, let staff know. Is that fair enough? Yeah, okay. Remember then, Council Valeria, Councilor Lumley, all in favor? That's carried. Um, any reports here at this point, Councilor Valeria? I'll just very quickly highlight um, 
in a similar association with that um, the white the white the walk through place, which is actually more of a place making content than anything else, but um, just active transportation for them for the folks um, in our street on the, the day after that conference, September 16th, uh, with some some actually really prominent speakers um, and uh, active transportation um, is often you know design and uh, um, and community building. So uh, last I heard, we didn't have too many sign up from the, the town of Gibson, so which is highly for that stuff from council if there's uh, there's an interest there. That's all for me. Just uh, for myself, I just want to comment. It's been a bit of a loss of summer for me. Uh, I had to put down my horse at the beginning of the summer. I put down my dog two days ago. And have a son that's been undergoing chemotherapy all summer. Uh, what seems to be uh, going in the right direction. So I share that with the uh, Councillor Bavaria. He's been through the experience and been helpful in uh, talking to me about that. So the summer is one that I hope to, to see the end of. Okay. Uh, the correspondence. 7.1. This is uh, the letter from the draft letter that was being circulated. But the council where did that come out of a specific part of a specific discussion that the house on uh, or uh, no, thanks, Mr. Rao. I was a little surprised to see Gibson on here. I think it was circulated um I think to every one present and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of other comment made. I think it was suggested it you know, could be sent to the town as correspondence if, if there was further interest. Um, but so there was, you know, there was a push from the, the main um, players. Of, I think it was West Vancouver and, and Squamish, but um, sure there wasn't any commitment made. But yeah, this, this letter in pretty much its form was, um, was circulated. I, I know they. They notice is following up, which I don't think they've really done, but it's uh, it's it's twice to see your name in the form of communication. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly, you know, given as you know, the Squamish uh, Indian bands, uh, I'll say tacit uh, approval of the project, uh, subject to meeting certain uh, criteria. I think some things have changed since this was originally. Uh, put together, it's probably a bit stronger than uh, I will support at this point. So I think I, at this point we just receive it for information and leave it at that. Um, 7.2, uh, Burn Coal. Um, they have a session next Tuesday, I believe, uh, at the Gibson's. Sir, if that is something for you? I'm not noticing my cell phone close to my. I'm not here, but it's not. Important. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Bernico. So I think next Tuesday, um, something around four o'clock to seven o'clock at Gibson's uh, uh, Rec Center, uh, they have their presentation there. There's also several binders in the town hall here uh, with respect to their information. So anybody that has an interest in that particular uh, proposal uh, should certainly attend their uh, open house so they can be informed and. Um, whatever submissions you would like. Um, so actually, I guess we better have a motion to receive of two, two letters, I suppose, so far in support. Actually, let's have a motion to receive all of them and continue on. So Council Sandenko, Councilor Valeria, in favor, and that's carried in the uh, The Canadian Cancer Society um, asking us to uh, I guess send a rep uh, our recommendations on to the province as well. Um, looks to me like what they're proposing here pretty much tracks the you know, smoking bylaw that we've uh, um, already sort of endorsed at this point. Um, is this something that we want to push on with or just leave it for information at this point? I think we've already taken a fair, uh, fair number of steps ourselves on this. So, so unless anybody uh, has a strong feeling, I would just leave it as we see it. Uh, BC Hydro, uh, 
I understand from staff there's nothing that uh, is in our plans that would uh, involve uh, accessing their beautification funds. That's, uh, okay. Okay, 8.1. Um, right. I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, we had that uh, discussion at the last uh, meeting. Um, this is for the uh, geothermal uh, field that's uh, required for uh, that. Sorry, if I'm, did I miss something there, Ryan? Uh, 8.1 is for the chip seal program. Sorry? 8.1 is for the chip seal program. Oh, yeah, uh, they're equal and, together. Okay, but, um, yes, sorry. thank you. Yeah, uh, revised agenda, yes, thank you. Okay, 8.1. Uh, David, you better speak to that then. Uh, just briefly. It's, uh, Actually, it's, it's, more, just, it's more of a final read. Okay, you have just put on our desk here, so I haven't had a chance to look at it. Yeah. So, 8.1 is regarding temporary borrowing by law 1232, and this relates to the chip seal program. Uh, that uh, project requires $392,000 in debt funding, and that funding has already been uh, approved through a loan authorization bylaw, including an AAP process that was all complete on July 19th. Uh, due to the timing of the Municipal Finance Authority's uh, requirements to get long-term debt, we're not able to meet the requirements for the fall issue, which means we'll be looking to get long-term debt for the spring of 2017. This, in essence, is like a bridge financing between the two. So the authorization is already in place um, for the debt. This would just be a temporary borrowing uh, between now and the spring issue that would allow us to get the funding to pay for the project that's already underway. And this would be um, based on a daily rate of, right now, it's about 1.38. So we'd be paying interest monthly, and then we would transfer it into a long-term 10-year debt in the spring that would be principal interest payments at that point. Okay, and probably in your report here, but we're still within our capacity for the short term borrowing, not borrowing. Well, this is temporary borrowing, so it's different than the short term borrowing. Oh, okay. This is a basically a, like a um, temporary borrowing for long term borrowing. It's already been approved, that's why it's this. <laughs> <laughs> short term, different, which I'll explain next. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, David, how is the project coming? Uh, right now, we've done some uh, kind of preliminary work uh, on some patching of some of the roads in preparation for the chip seal. Um, and, uh, and then we're uh, working on Hillcrest um, with the drainage portion of the project uh, and the, uh, <coughs> um, the ditch actually in the, in the new culverts held up quite well uh, to that uh, onslaught we had on Thursday, I guess it was Friday. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, so some of the roads that didn't get patched, uh, if they were far enough gone, we actually grind up the asphalt with the uh, gravel and chip seal over that, whereas other roads were patching them and then chip sealing over, over the uh, patched asphalt. Uh, so the polar thing is happening during the week of September 15th, and right now we're on schedule for, I believe it's the week of the 26th, I think it is, the last week of September for the actual chip sealing itself. Um, so. Everything is on uh, on target so, so far. Um, I'm anticipating that you know that's a little bit of a soft date for the chip ceiling itself, just because uh, weather can really throw a, um, a spanner in the works uh, uh, for the chip ceiling uh, contractor. So you know it can it can kind of ruin his carefully laid plans. So uh, yeah, you know, for the sake of this point, it's a, it's a last week of September. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes. Okay. You move the, uh, the uh, receiving the report and uh, giving first, second, and third reading to that temporary board model. Okay. okay. Second, Councilor Gloria. Okay. All in favor then? That's carried. Okay. Thank you, uh, Brian. Thanks, David. Okay. So what I thought was 8.1 is now 8.2. Uh, and that's for the uh, short term borrowing. Well, it's a temporary one, right? Okay. Uh, and this is for the uh, $125,000 for the uh, geo uh, thermal field that's uh, required, uh, going to be required in support of the uh, Park Line Phase 3 uh, development. Uh, so uh, we had a very thorough discussion of that in the last meeting. So unless anything has come up on that, then we'll just ask for a motion to receive that report. And that's for second and third reading as well for that matter. 
Councilor Lumley, thank you. Councilor Larry, a second. Uh, favor. Okay, Ms. Perry, thanks, uh, Rain. Uh, okay, 8.3, part plan phase three. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I prepared a short presentation to summarize the this report. First of all, I'll uh, give you context of phase three part and uh, oh wait, I have to look at the slides to uh I'm going to see the map that you can see this. Gold computer as the map is heading up. Uh, I think most people are very well aware of the location of the phase three subdivision, but just in case you're not entirely sure. This is the current phase one of the parkland, uh, mostly developed now. You can see the houses there. It's a bit vague still. This is the tennis park and the park there on Woodsburg. Paint road over here on the left. Phase two is underway right now down here. It was already zoned in 2010. And this area to the right, in the right hand corner, that's phase three. Um, the reason for this report is to follow up on staff of council recommendations from July. Um, the 5 to 2016, just now to the public hearing. Uh, council asked for a staff report to uh, address the questions raised by uh, uh, the public but also by council members at this uh, uh, council meeting in July and that the file will be brought back for further consideration. Um, at the public hearing in uh, July, we heard a number of concerns regarding phase three and I summarized them here. Uh, and I'll discuss them in, uh, in the coming slides. Uh, centering about green belts and parkland area, and the density, stormwater management, those are the key things. Um, to quickly give you a summary of those issues and, and some backgrounds and more information about it. This is about this is clarification about the green belt, which was uh, uh, part of the conceptual subdivision layout in 2009. Uh, at, at that time, the tentative subdivision layout was sketched out for the whole area all the way to Pony Road. And uh, phase one and two were developed exactly according to the plan. Phase three was penciled in as well with a green belt here through the middle. Um, since then, uh, the plans have changed, and uh, uh, we now need um, uh, an area of public land that is also suitable to house a stormwater pond. And that's the area right here where there were proposed to be some properties, but instead of that, there is now a proposal in the zoning bylaw and in the conceptual subdivision that we also have uh, in our office to uh, have a piece of public land there for a stormwater pond and, and for parks and trees. But talking about park land, that was another thing that came up. Uh, some people were going to raise concerns about uh, losing existing park land. That's not the case. Uh, you can see here on this map, um, this is all of the property that is uh, around parkland. Those are two large parcels that were initially uh, a single piece or two pieces. And uh, during the first uh, two phases at that time, uh, we received a park dedication and public land dedication of 50%, which is all the green here on the map. This is the park with the tennis court. There's a green belt here. There's a strip with a berm down the south, and there's an area continuous leading north south. 50% um, back then, uh, and I should know that it's three times more than the, what is the legal requirement for subdivisions. Is a legal requirement this time of the time of subdivision. Uh, local government is entitled to 5%. Anything else can be discussed and negotiated and agreed upon voluntarily, but it's not a requirement. So we've got way more parkland than would be the minimum required. And that was uh, logical at the time because uh, as part of the Upper Gibson's neighborhood plan, the town had devised a plan with a lot of good green space and open space in Upper Gibson's. It was part and parcel of the whole concept of Upper Gibson's to have a uh, village like, a town like uh, uh, type of development, small scale, with lots of green space. Uh, those lands are not changed at this point. 
Um, another concern that came up was the question about density. And in the, in the previous plans that I showed you, that's definitely it showed 26 uh, residential lots. In the current plans that we have, but they're still in the review, and the one that they have shown here on the right hand side, there are 24 residential lots, and the 25th one is uh, the parcel for the town. I made a mistake, there should have been 24. Um, so at this point, it looks like the deep density will actually go down. It has to do with the preference of the developer for certain uh, the, the size of the lots that is not quite the minimum allowed in the zoning, and, and also with the fact that people need roads to get to these areas. So there's only a limited amount of space available for them. So at this point, it looks like it will not be 26, it will be less. There is an option in the line before to uh, tie that down, just in case maybe plans change, change again in the future. It could be limited through restrictive covenant to make sure that the number of 26 is not exceeded. Uh, and stormwater was another issue that came up. It was, uh, uh, I think, some misunderstandings around that. And, if you and please, uh, director of engineer, please jump in if you feel I'm not covering it uh, completely. Uh, but this is a sketch of what the stormwater uh, pond works, how it works. So what it does, it obviously collects uh, flows, not mostly regular flows, but particularly peak flows. And um, uh, the ones, the regular ones that are required in a subdivision bylaw. So if you think about peak flows like we had last week. Actually, we had very heavy rainstorms. Those have a certain uh, chance of reoccurring, and that frequency, that's what the engineers base their designs on. So for a regular developers in town, our subdivision bio requires a retention of one in 10 year storms. So every the, 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 the events that only occur every 10 years need to be covered. The bones, the, the, the stormwater management on parkland is actually more, uh, more, robust, more robust. It takes more on more rain or whatever the case may be, it's, uh, laid, it's designed for a 1 in 100 year storm, which is better than 1 in 10. Uh, the outflow then, on the other hand, which was all the concern, does the water flow too fast to Chasta Creek and does it cause erosion? Well, it's very unlikely that it's because of this particular area, because the outflow on this stormwater pond in the apartment is limited to uh, the flow that you wouldn't see more than one once every two years. So it means that even if there's this big one, one in 100 year storm, uh, the water gets collected and then it gets uh, released gradually uh, with this reduced rate to make sure that downstream there are no sudden flash floods occurring. So that's the store, story about how the stormwater management on the parkland works. Can you get to add something? Yeah, I'll probably just add one, one thing. The, um, the catchment, so the catchment area is essentially uh, um, you know, if you've got a, a basin, you know, of uh, surrounded by mountains, uh, and you know, all the water falls on there and then drains down through through one point. A catchment area can be can be defined by every drop of water that falls on that area goes out that channel. Uh, so parkland is within a certain catchment area, and it's a very small fraction of the catchment area. The catchment area goes up into uh, Mount Elphinstone, up through Gravel Pit. Uh, so parkland itself is a very small portion of the uh, of the catchment area. Um, there's far more lands in the SCRD and in Crown land than, than actually exists in the town uh, that uh, that contribute to flows down in our chapter creek. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, so this map shows what Dave's talking about over here. Parkland is located just here on the right hand corner. But the tributary that we're talking about is this arm here that uh, leads to the main course of Chester Creek down here in Elphinstone. Connects to the town this way uh, and crosses the highway near Jerry Harris and the Park Plaza Mall. Then continues there to the north, exits the town again, goes further up the hill. Uh, Mount Elphinstone over here is where the, the gravel mine is, and over here in, in, in the forested areas on the slopes of Mount Elphinstone. And uh, that was uh, this, this topic was covered by Dave Banks. Um, then some um, concerns were also raised about road closure and the notification process. The road closure was included in the subdivision application earlier this year. Uh, it was still under review. Um, and um, what I should note is that one, by the time we put out a notification sign on my property, that's at the very early stages of the report of the, of the process, I should say. 
it, it means also that not the whole review has been done just yet, it has not been finalized. Um, in terms of notification, we did add additional signage uh, when we heard some concerns from a number of people in the supervision. And uh, we placed two signs. Uh, we also made sure that instead of just taking the narrow 50 meters around the site, we, we followed the whole uh, parking area. Um, so the road closure itself is no longer part of the conceptual subdivision plans, but that's still under review. So there's no final subdivision plan just yet. And uh, because we wanted to avoid that confusion between, well, the zoning map shows parcels and lot layouts and sizes, uh, <coughs> zoning is not about that just yet. The zoning sets the stage with the RC zone that's proposed for this property that allows for certain lot sizes, setbacks, and minimum lifts. <coughs> uh, the subdivision by, uh, plan still under review, we thought it was better to uh, not show that on the zoning map. So you'll see in a moment on the updated zoning map that the details of the layout are no longer there. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, there were also a couple of uh, phase one concerns uh, expressed to the uh, hearing. The two main ones were uh, the lack of parking. Some people felt this is the case uh, in an existing neighborhood. <coughs> Those were just issues. Now, with regards to parking in the existing neighborhood, um, uh, construction follows the zoning by the requirements, which is for two stories per house. For most uh, sites in the subdivision, a third site. Uh, is also available on, on site. And this usually is a garage for one or two cars, and then some area on the property for a second or third car. Uh, this <coughs> is limited, that's true, and it has to do with the way the, 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 the neighborhood has been laid out, but also the way we have updated our uh, subdivision environment. So instead of using old fashioned wider roads with lots of parking on one side or on both sides, we are building much more um, minimal. With narrow roads, but also fewer parking options. So, uh, yes, it's absolutely possible that there are parking uh, issues when uh, somebody has a party and lots of people come over. It will be busy at times, not all the time, hopefully, but that would be bad. Uh, so, yes, it's a concern that we can acknowledge at the same time. It, it comes with the type of neighborhood that was designed in. In terms of the drainage issues, um, uh, Stormwater in general works well, but there are a couple of features that don't work, and they were uh, tried out and implemented in the start uh, because it seemed a good idea at the time, and they agreed to add to it. But the two two items that don't quite work as they should are the roadside swales and the permeable concrete that's in the middle of the lanes, and, and those solutions are no longer going to be used going forward. Then, can you explain that? The um Permeable concrete down the center of the laneways uh, was something in the uh, previous uh, iteration of the bylaw, uh, subdivision development bylaw, and we've uh, um, we scrapped that uh, in, the, in the current bylaw. Um, largely didn't really hold up with very well. The construction traffic uh, was, yeah, terrific. It's, it's first strike, I guess. Um, the roadside swales, we haven't abandoned roadside swales, but because of our change in our cross section for roads, we've actually got more room for the swales. And uh, uh, there just was a, a fairly limited, um, limited available boulevard to to construct those swales in, in phase one, um, and also we ran into issues with uh, fairly flat grade uh, through phase one, and actually in phase two they the roads were actually built up uh, a bit in order to get better better grade and better flow on the on the swales. Thank you. Yeah, and, and if council would like uh, staff to follow up on all the phase one concerns, what we suggested that maybe uh, a neighborhood walk could be organized where some staff and neighborhood residents go out in the neighborhood and look at those particular sites that, that people are concerned about. It also gives uh, staff an opportunity to explain what the issue is there and, and what, we, what will be done about it, either in the near future or in the longer term. Um, let me see, the updated zoning map then. I was just talking about that. It's, it's more general. So what you see here though on the map is space free area. And two, divided into two areas, the, the greener area here, which is the PRO area, parks, recreation, and open space. That's the area that um, um, will be home for, to the stormwater pond, but also uh, trails. And it's the exact same area as the initial green belt that was tentatively fenced in, in the previous design. And then the rest of the area is labeled RC, and that's the RC zoning for cottage lots, small lot zoning, that is. 
and it's, it's applied to the rest of the remainder of the property there. And that's going to allow them for the future subdivision to take place once the design of that subdivision is uh, finalized. Uh, changing a map like this does require a second public hearing. Uh, so there's a recommendation about that in the, in the report. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, as part of the zoning bio, I should also summarize the amenities that we've been discussing uh, with the developer. And uh, I didn't mention that at the start, but Nicole Hagedorn is present as well, just in case councillors questions for, for her. Um, these are the uh, community amenities and affordable housing contributions we discussed so far, and we recommend to, uh, to uh, confirm them as part of the zoning application. Uh, Cash and U for two affordable housing units. It's going to be $60,000 for the affordable housing reserve fund. Uh, the inclusion of uh, additional landscaping in the existing cleaned up areas, mainly around the burn and up to Payne Road. And that will be done through a development permit, which goes together with the subdivision, which will follow later. So we don't have the final details in that just yet. Additional public land, the area that I just pointed out on the map, which is for green space. And uh, given that the river serves as public hearing, we do recommend to uh, include in this, this would be secured for government. Uh, we could also uh, mention the number of 26 lots there to provide some certainty on the density there as well. I um, also wanted to mention, bring to your attention, the Upper Gibson's Labour Plan. I was making some references to it already. This is the uh, concept map uh, from, the, from the OCP that shows the conceptual plan for that area. The colors don't quite come out. There's two little shades of yellow, actually, which the presenter doesn't seem to be able to project here. But there is a yellow here on the outskirts, which is more is meant for the cluster type development. And in Parkland phase one, we have two larger parcels with cluster development. And then on the interior of this, this map, uh, is a different shade of yellow, which is for cottage lots, which are the small lots, which are proposed for phase three, which is over here. Yes. And on the outskirts uh, is a larger lot size, which you can see right now along Payne Road where the duplexes are built. That's a slightly larger lot size. The area down below here that was changed a couple of years ago when the, the Labour Road designation from there was actually moved over to uh, Suncrest Road. It was part of an application with uh, Gibson Building Supply. Um, yeah, some other things that I wanted to mention from the uh, district community plan is that stormwater was identified as a key uh, design issue that needed to be fixed and, and addressed and designed properly. And one of the ways that the OCP admission to do that was uh, as part of the open space for parks and trails. Um, it, was, uh, it specifically says that the open space network is not just for trails, it could, should also house habitat, but also uh, solutions for stormwater. So that the whole neighborhood acts, works as a um, as a uh, as a one whole piece instead of different pieces coming together. And, and further, as you know, with our eco asset strategy that we developed over the recent years, uh, it it, uh, it fits very well with the direction that the OCP set for this area, uh, using nature uh, to deal with uh, uh, things like stormwater. Um, so the design that we have with the phase three really fits well with the fish community. Uh, communication, um, there is some concerns at the public hearing. So we have a couple ideas how to uh, improve our communication on this particular proposal. So today I'm briefing you on the issues in the background so I hope things have become more clear. Uh, we also have a draft information sheet attached to this report, which we plan to send out to the neighborhood to give them uh, some written information to go by. We also recommend that there will be an open house uh, later this month, or perhaps in October, to uh, have some more discussion with people and clarify any questions that there may be. And then uh, the recommended next steps uh, are on the front page of the report um, to deal with the final change. The second reading will be rescinded, and then given again as amended. We recommend to uh, ask staff to send an information sheet to the parkland owners and residents to hold an open house and to organize a second public hearing in the October. Uh, that also has um, the tentative date I put in there was in response to uh, some discussions with uh, the developer who also has asked that uh, once all these items from the public hearing could be cleared up that the process could be resumed as soon as possible. 
just given the current market uh, for the community getting the bird that is uh, on the way as well. And finally, there's a recommendation to make sure that the mayor and public officer are authorized to sign the interest of the government as, as it comes to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Andre. It's a very thorough report. Uh, maybe some questions from the uh, council on this one, but uh, uh, for those of you that are here from Parkland, <clears throat> following uh, the session that we did have back in July, it was the feeling of council uh, generally that uh, we, the town had not done an adequate job of at least making sure the information uh, was out there. Uh, and so that's the reason that the staff is coming back with these recommendations to basically do a do-over. Uh, I don't know, you know what the result ultimately will be, but uh, nevertheless, we're going to make sure that uh, all the information that we have is clearly available and that the decisions will then be made um, based on that information being provided to uh, residents uh, and following uh, a uh, further public hearing. Uh, once this is uh, moved forward. So, any clarification or anything that the council needs at this point? This is going to come back to us again. So, so right now, what's before us is a basically recommendation to uh, rescind the previous second reading, uh, to give a second reading to the uh, amended one that we have here. Uh, have the information sheet delivered to all parkland owners and residents. Uh, an open house uh, will be organized by the town in advance of the public hearing. And then the public hearing uh, will be set for Monday, October the 3rd. Uh, and there won't be anything else other than that. So we'll take whatever time is necessary. Uh, and then the covenant to ensure the $60,000 to the affordable housing fund, uh, as well as say, the comment on the effort. Uh, units that can be uh, constructed in their case. Council Barton. I also wanted to thank staff for very thorough. I appreciate all the concerns that were brought up at uh, the original public hearing. And it's, uh, it's good to see them all laid out with some more information. Um, I I support the idea of the neighborhood walk having you know, separate from our combination of the open house and when you're talking drainage and other issues, I think there's only really the best ways to be standing um, on the site. So I think that, that should probably be included as it would be before the open house. Um, I, I do have a bit of a concern about covenanting the, the maximum number of lots at a, at a density less than what the OCP would allow. Um, I feel like we're working towards density in a lot of uh, in the town in general. So I'm, a little concerned about capping it when um, when we at a, at, a, at a lower level than what we normally would. Um, so I, I mean, I'd like to hear if anyone else has that concern. But um, I also have a personal point on um, October third that um, to resolve it. We're all going to be at ESAM in Victoria the week before, and I, I've already made bookings to uh, to stay on the island until and to be back just in time for a meeting call on October fourth. So it's um, I, would, I, would, I would either not be able to attend or have to change those, those plans. And I, I recognize that we're probably going to be open on October or following day, and maybe uh, two weeks away isn't, isn't ideal, but uh, you know, those are my comments now. Right, and then Councillor Sandango just uh, indicated that she is um, out of town on the third as well. Uh, so we're going to have to. Uh, um, uh, this went back to the number of units. Um, and that's the discussion that we've had with the uh, proponent uh, about the uh, number of units that they're content with in terms of developing that area the 26 or 24, I guess it is really. Yeah, Mr. Um, right now, they're uh, Anticipating 24 uh, based on the current layout, uh, a limit of 26 is, uh, is acceptable for them. They don't expect that there will be more than that. If, but what they have in mind is the limit. So, um, at the same time, yeah, there, there could be a little later. It, it's um, 
this, this is specifically meant to deal with the upcoming subdivision. Um, so it's possible that down the road, maybe the zoning for RC does change. And for example, one of the things not allowed currently in RC is a uh, secondary suite. It just allows for one house and those smaller lots at the moment. But maybe in the future uh, that will be changed. It would apply, it would apply to these properties too, if that were the case, unless the, the government is so, uh, so restricted that it couldn't be the case. But the intent of this recommendation is to limit the number of properties as part of the upcoming subdivision. Okay. And basically, a covenant can be amended uh, in the future. So, yes, David. Um, just further to what um, uh, Andre was saying, uh, I, I believe that the intent would be to discharge the covenant once it was uh, subdivided into 24 or 26 lots um, so that that covenant wasn't on each parcel. Um, because you can't have a, a single family lot uh, be subdivided into 26 lots uh, further down the road, so it, it, it would have served its purpose by the time uh, the subdivision would be registered. Okay, so basically the restriction would just involve this particular subdivision. Okay, after that, it falls into vacator zone. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, in any event, the covenants uh, are not going to happen until the uh, Really, after the public hearing and close to adoption, or just before adoption, I would think. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we've got to look at another date here. Um, the, um, yes. Um, I'd like to suggest that either October fourth or October eleventh would be considered. As October fourth is that. Is that is that a council meeting? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess we, uh, you're, you're, back with, uh, you're back for that, uh, Council Larry. What about Council St. Jenkins? You're back as well. Uh, so I suppose we could uh, look at uh, 5 o'clock, I guess, on October the 4th. Um, should it turn out that um, there's more submissions than we anticipate, uh, we simply can uh, convene the council meeting and then recess it. I, I would agree with uh, the council of Valeria. I think the walk through would be like a, a great idea. So I know we're trying to nail down a date for the public hearing, but obviously that walk through would have to take place prior to. I think, uh, uh, I think I'd probably go on it. Because uh, I mean, you can look at maps and overlays and plans and everything, but it's another thing to actually go up there and see what some of the concerns that have been raised through the public submissions. Uh, you know, just so I'd be, I'd be interested in that. So I guess that would be a date we have to pick before public hearing. Yeah. Um, what's what's your timing on that? You're really thinking about. You know, what are we today? September the 6th. We've been looking at something in the middle of September. Yes, for the uh, open house, I was looking at the week of the 20th or the 27th. The 27th is the UCM conference, so the council is, is keen on being uh, present at that meeting as well. Then we have the September, September 20th meeting. Unless the uh, public hearing was held later in October, then there's a bit more time to do the open house. and walk uh, early October. But I think it can be done. I was anticipating that at least the organized open house. So when the council decides to add the neighborhood walk to it, we'll make it work. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, that's good. Um, I mean, speaking of turn here, um, the neighborhood walk, uh, it was more geared towards issues in phase one. And so if we wanted to take the lessons learned from phase one and the input for that, um, it would be in a way more applicable to the uh, actual subdivision servicing. Um, so we could potentially have uh, the walkthrough to deal with, you know, drainage issues and concerns raised about the design standards um, after the public hearing uh, and before the subdivision servicing uh, has been established. Uh, and we would still, we would still glean the the let's say lessons learned and the input from from the residents at the appropriate time. Just a, just a thought. Right. Okay. So what you're saying is that that information doesn't necessarily impact 
the rezoning issue. It's sort of the next stage, which is mm -hmm. development permit. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, in any event, uh, we we just you know, schedule an open house uh, for sure. Um, if it turns out you can do the the walkabout at the same time, twenty minutes. But if, if that doesn't work, then you know, we can do that at another point. So uh, September twentieth, I'll be able to do that. That's good. Is that a council meeting? Mm -hmm. oh, it is. Um, so when uh, so. You just talk about the week of September 20th, right? Um, so I have to make other arrangements as well, so I don't need to pin down that date today, I think. But, um, okay. But it does depend on the public hearing, depending on what that moment will be, to determine yeah. how much time I have before. Is there a council there? Um, we'll make the minutes from the previous public hearing an hour and 20 minutes, so that, that's at 4 to 5 p.m. on October 4th. We can get it. Likely to complete it in that time. Okay. All right. So, so we go with October fourth for the public hearing, and then we would try to arrange an open house during the week of September twentieth. Is that what we're doing? Mm -hmm. We notify council and the residents of when the when the event occur. Okay. Okay. So, are we okay with that then? So, the recommendations that are here with the change that. Um, um, would be an open house regarding phase three be organized by the town during the week of September 20, uh, and that the second public hearing would be held on uh, Tuesday, October the 4th at 5 p.m. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, Council Larry, Council Lundman, all in favor then? Okay, Mr. Carey, thank you for your work on that. Uh, okay, uh, any inquiries at this point? Uh, so if you please uh, state your name, place of residence, and limit your question to two minutes. Thank you. Yes, um, My name is Mary Catherine Anderson. I'm resident of Elkinstone. Um, I was here at the July meeting and voiced a concern. Um, at that time, the Mayor Grove pointed out that uh, I'm not a resident of Gibson's and that I would have to seek redress through my jurisdiction in the CRD um, because there is damage to the Chester tributary system. So we've engaged in that process happily, and um, I look forward to the town of Gibson's being represented there and working in a participatory and collaborative manner. Um, our first meeting is scheduled for this Thursday, actually. Well, actually, it's our third, but with the town of Gibson's involved. Um, so I just am here tonight to let you know that. And also um, that I don't wish any hard feelings in my approach. Um, it's simply that I find the matter quite grave, considering that it's one of riparianism, which you know speaks to a higher level of regulations. Um, secondly, that it's a watershed. Actually, it's one of the four, of one of the four watersheds, the town of Gibson's. And um, thirdly, that because there's been an over 10 years of documentation and direct requests to yourselves by a well-known, long-standing civic member. Um, I feel that there's been civic negligence at a governmental or local authority level here. Um, so that said, um, I would like to um, just get some clarification. I thought the presentation was excellent, a lot of work. Um, and I just have a question regarding catchment. Um, I understand the general concept of it. Uh, my understanding, however, with stormwater, and I refer to the stormwater guidebook of 2002, which still is the authoritative framework for this, is that what causes the increase in rates of flow is due to impervious. So, and it's pretty much a ratio. The more that there's impervious, which means you know, 
asphalt or concrete, the higher the rate of runoff. And um, the documentation from Chapter Tributary, the timeline is consistent with the um, IGA Plaza. That's why we've used the Skeleton to use the parkland as a trigger. Well, there's nothing against parklands. We wish them all the best, and, you know, definitely. Um, but it's an opportunity to bring this ongoing issue onto the agenda formally. Uh, so I do have to question a little bit around where the flow, the increase of flows are coming from. Um, and we do have to question in your report um, the alternative reasons given, some of which are climate change and agricultural use. Um, but that, that will be flushed out through the SCRD process. Um, I just want to, you know, I'm, I'm asking actually if you have more um, clarification to provide around impervious versus catchment, because to my understanding, it really is the rate of impervious that determines the increase in flow. Okay. Just a quick response to that. Sure. I mean, that, that could be one consideration, but with the parkland development, uh, as I mentioned, or as Andre mentioned, uh, the stormwater um, pond is intended to take that increase and then release it at a, at a non damaging flow or low, a low rate. So, yes, if, if uh, we do not have that pond there, um, and IGA has similar stormwater, not a pond, but they have similar stormwater uh, uh, management uh, in place uh, where it releases at a non damaging flow, because yes, we do recognize that impervious materials. Uh, um, do increase the runoff uh, where it was previously vegetated. Yeah. My second clarification um, is in, in the town of Gibson's own reports, it, it, in the ISMP, it had noted that there was turbid discharge launching into Chester and it did link to Parkland Phase 1. I don't know if it was resolved, but it was standing, I think, in two, 2006. And that. So um, my second question then is actually to do with the pipes the actual infrastructure. Um, everything points to it being a networked infrastructure that the mouth of which feeds into a vacant lot just directly south of 101 that feeds into 611. So my question is, if underground, the piping itself is networked and continual development, even with cashments in place, is still going to increase the level of flows. And um, with respect to our creek, it's now uh, over six feet deep with clay beds exposed, while my trees are, you know, it's sort of damage and, and that'll get flushed out. But so my, my clarification here is with, is it networked? Is the actual pipes between, at the intersection of 101 and, and Payne Pratt? I don't quite understand the question, but there is, we have, uh, so the stormwater pond at Parkland, for example, uh, drains into a pipe that does eventually make its way down to Highway 101, but as I say, the flows are at a reduced rate, and so same with IGA Mall, they had a similar uh, requirement, that, uh, we had a similar requirement at the time, um, or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, yeah, anyway, they've got stormwater, um, same stormwater, um, uh, uh, retention stormwater treatment uh, um, at their at their site, and so yeah, they need to take those. Yes, they do ultimately come down to a, a point. As, as I say, they're at uh, lower rates. They're not the high flow rates. To help expedite um, the process, would it be possible to receive blueprints of the infrastructure? <laughs> is it, is that I don't know. Sorry, that um, you could you could talk to uh, we can talk to the, to uh, yeah. the staff. I will. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any further inquiries? Oh. And if you want to include us in your walkthrough, feel free. Okay. Sorry, is there someone else? Then? Good evening, councillors, mayor. My condolences to your horse and dog. Um, I too have had a son go through a camp street and I know the stress you're under. Um, good luck and Godspeed. Yeah. Um, I received a notification, notification today. I'm sorry, my name is Mark Evans, 259 Glasgow Road. 
I received a notification today of the proposed uh, um, reading uh, from the staff report, and um, it has uh, come at such short notice that I am unable to present anything at this time. Um, so I see which, which one are you referring to? The uh, affordable housing. Oh, the affordable housing. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that you have just granted four thousand dollars to do a study to allow our park plans to be given to uh, uh, someone else. And uh, I, I see that this is not in. And again, I apologize because I'm going to jump around a little bit here because I've just received the notice today. And uh, it, it is in contrary to uh, some of our bylaws, our eco asset strategy endorsed by the committee in February 2015, the November 2000 strategic plan, in which case we maintain our green spaces, and the 2015 strategic plan, which I see the, the uh, 2016 and 18 uh, strategic plans up there as well, endorsing the, uh, uh, the maintenance and uh, continued viability of our green spaces, which we are now going to be shutting down and giving to an opportunity for somebody to buy or lease or build on this land. And I find that in contravention to our bylaws, and quite frankly, I don't find that it's a legal application that somebody else would be able to purchase or use land that is not maintained in the public domain without uh, citizens having an opportunity to buy that land. So for example, uh, that land right next door to mine, I would like to buy that land rather than have it go to affordable housing. I would, uh, that, that uh, the purchase of that land would then be used by the town of Gibsons to further support developments that, like we've just seen to offset the cost of uh, affordable housing there. Uh, speaking of which, uh, $60,000 from that parcel as well under what the uh, required funding is, I would believe, and uh, from uh, developments, and I'm sorry, I haven't done my homework, as I said, the <coughs> times today. Uh, I have a friend who just developed uh, a parcel in Seashell, and they said it was over $100,000 to develop each parcel with the requirements of bringing services in. So $60,000 for two parcels is well under what was required or is going to be required to develop these parcels of land. Um, We receiving my letter. Okay. And just to clarify, Mr. Evans, um, uh, we're, we're a long way from a, a decision making thing here. We are talking about road allowances, by the way, not not parks as such. Uh, I mean, I know you can, might, there might be a green space in in your perspective, I, I don't know, but they are road allowances. Um, and, uh, the funds uh, the funds today uh, really are only intended for. Uh, to look at whether or not this is even possible to do. I mean, we don't even know whether we would actually uh, actually sell the property or whether it would only be on a long-term lease with the town. Yes. Uh, we have no idea at this point, and that's the purpose of the uh, of the studies at this stage to see even if it's even possible. You know, you talked about uh, you know development costs. That's part of what the feasibility study has to look at because. They may find that between the cost of doing this and producing, we might not end up with something affordable. Uh, and that's what we have to find out is whether that's possible. So there will be um, there will be further opportunity on uh, to, to provide information or your viewpoints on this. We're, we're a fair ways from uh, from that. So I will make sure that, uh, that you're clearly notified if that comes forward in any fashion. And it's too late to, to pull back that four thousand dollars that we've already allocated to this. However, there are, there is a lot of legal uh, maneuvering and amendments to be done prior to granting any further action. And plus, there's there's surveys to be performed that I've only just been notified today of uh, moving some of the services both above ground and below ground to allow for these properties to be made available. First of all, whether they are made available to the public or a restricted number of few. And I'm not sure whether that's a legal option that the town has at this point. As I said, it only received the notification today. Uh, the, the one area that the gentleman has asked Matt um, with his house to do the feasibility on is one lot um, out of 
uh, in the required five that you um, and, uh, it seems preposterous that we would uh, uh, even consider one and not the rest of the five because if you can't get five you can't get the funding so um, this particular lot is a green space at this time. It's full of trees and allows communities, it allows for runoff, it allows for uh, kids playgrounds, etc. So I thank you for your time and I'll speak you with your son. Thank you, uh, Mr. Evans. I appreciate it very much. Right on that, and 
we'll try to keep you informed as to as moving forward. But thank you for um, you know, sharing your, your thoughts on that. We have a question. Is there another one? My name is Vanessa Hall. That's right. My name is Vanessa Hall. I'm also a resident of the Terrible Shows. And uh, my concern sort of pertains to Stephanie's. I, I just don't understand why we are not using, as, as often communities do, new subdivisions where, we're, where the developer is required to provide an affordable housing site rather than buy out, uh, pay $60,000 and not put an affordable yeah. housing site. Buy out the option. And instead impose them on existing neighborhoods that are long established and have green space areas and wildlife corridors and are already designated by your own plan, not buildable upon. Why are we even bothering with feasibility studies and expensive you know, geotechnical reports? Why would we not go to existing subdivisions? And, and start anew. And when we asked this of the Affordable Housing Society, they said that's what they wanted to do. But the town said, no, well, you can use these dead ends just to get your funding. So it just doesn't seem logical. It doesn't seem, I, I don't understand the logic of using dead ends of roads. And, and one of the points in the, in the town's report was, well, it, they would integrate throughout lower Gibsons. That's three affordable housing units in a two block radius of an existing neighborhood where new subdivisions are developing and saying, no, we'll just pay money instead of having affordable housing. So it, it, it doesn't seem logical. It seems like it's being imposed on us. And we also don't feel, looking at what happened in Parkland, that as the neighborhood, we are being involved in the process. We are being informed after the fact and not before. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to take the opportunity to explain uh, expectations around affordable housing contributions. So I understand that some people feel now affordable housing contributions should be the value of a unit. Well, that's unreasonable. We have had policy development in the past with the community development, sorry, the development industry on Trenchland Coast. They cannot provide $200,000 or 250 for an affordable unit. That's not how that works. So it's based, and I'll try to explain it in a nutshell, it's complicated, sorry. But um, the contribution is based on the discount that a developer would provide on a unit that he would build. So say, uh, say if somebody would build a house in Parkland, and a affordable price point would be 250 Could be done, although it becomes harder and harder as the market heats up. Could be done, would require a discount of, say, twenty to $50,000, somewhere in that range, probably. Now, that's the contribution that we're looking at. That's what we think is reasonable to ask from uh, the developers. Uh, and that explains why, you know, at first glance, you think, well, it doesn't add up. No, it doesn't add up. And it's not meant to add up. Uh, meant to add up. So I hope that clarifies that a little bit. It's not, it's, not the, it's not the numbers. It's the fact that you are taking away. You're trying to promote affordable housing, and you're taking two away from an existing subdivision. Okay, that's the yeah, point. That's that's where, that's uh, point. Yeah, we've, we've, we've exhausted our, our inquiry period here. So. Oh, no. oh, that's not fair. Oh, Objection! Um, so, uh, there, will, uh, there, there will be other opportunities on this topic. We're a long way from uh, anything for us. Is reopened to the public? Is that coming up? Where's the public? Uh, yes, if you want to hang around, it's not a closed meeting. But, but nothing will happen after that. I can tell you that this simply will be closed. Uh, so um, I, I just want to tell you that staying around is not going to be useful to you. Uh, so I just want to make sure you understand. So there, there will be further discussions around this uh, this topic where uh, once we have some information that's uh, been provided through uh, feasibility, we'll see whether or not it's something that should even be uh, pursued. So. May, may I ask right? one question, please, on stormwater issues? Uh, you know, I think you know, uh, my council here has indicated we passed our 10 minutes, so I'll ask it. I would just like to have um, a little bit uh, more notification because we in the community got these letters today and the meeting regarding giving us more information was tonight. So if we could just request a little bit more advanced notice. A little more foresight on that. 
Thank you. I hear your point. Um, there will be more opportunities. This this meeting tonight was not that was not the purpose of your letter. The letter was to inform you about the circulating work, which is part of the feasibility study. Um, so in the future, if, if this proceeds, and I think we'll keep you posted. I think you probably we can get posted about when the um, feasibility res results will come back. Um, but other than that, before that project gets anywhere, there will be a rezoning and a road closure process, and the whole both of them have public notification requirements. But uh, today, uh, I will let you know that uh, we'll keep you posted about uh, once we know more about the results of the feasibility study. Thank you. Point of order. Uh, I'm sorry, my name don't get to do it. Yeah, no, no, no. Motion to close, please. Thank you, Council. You're on the very end. Thank you, San Diego. Swale is very shallow. Swale is very shallow.